So we have arrived at the last Sunday in our study in Ephesians today. We're in Ephesians chapter 6. So if you would, grab a Bible, open up your Bible app on your phone, reach down there in the seats in front of you, grab that Bible, uh, go to the table of contents, find where Ephesians is, go to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to wrap up our study on Ephesians there today. Paul gives us this great conversation. Uh, every Christ follower at some point begins to realize that being a Christian is a battleground, not a playground. And in the last chapter of Ephesians, Paul tells us that we already have everything we need to win the battle. Furthermore, we've already won the battle. We fight from our victory, not for victory. And he reminds us how that works. Now, we face three different enemies that... Uh, Paul's specifically speaking of one here, but we face three different enemies. The one, uh, one of those is the world. Uh, all you have to do is turn on the news to find out that the world is an enemy of ours. The world lives in such a way that is contrary to God's way. The world is opposed to the way of Jesus. In fact, uh, we're told in Scripture to be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus said that, as a matter of fact. And be in the world, but not of the world. Like, he wants us to be in the world, and so it's not that we don't love the people of the world, and it's just that we don't want to love the things of the world, right? So the, the, the part of the world that, that battles against the things that are opposed to God. The second enemy that we face is ourselves. Can I get an Amen. Our flesh is what the scripture refers to. In Romans, Paul talks about it this way. Maybe you can relate. Paul says, man, there are things that I do that I don't want to do. And there are things that I want to do that I can't do. Right? Can anybody relate to that? Like, like we battle against our own flesh sometimes. And, and then the third enemy we have is Satan. Our enemy is Satan. Now Satan was, I don't have time to go through all the scripture this morning, but you'll just have to trust me on this. Satan was an angel in heaven. In fact, he was the angel that led worship in heaven. But at some point, because the root of all sin, I shared this last week, is self. At some point, Satan decided that it would be better for him for the worship to be directed towards himself than toward God. And so he and some of his partnership his company was cast down from heaven and, and now that's what he does is he tries to get us to turn our focus on ourselves instead of on God that's why self is at the root of all sin and we battle Satan we're told that he's the God of this age in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 4 he's the prince of this world now listen he has power on this earth but he has no authority because Jesus took care of that on the cross and what we're going to learn that Paul tells us today in Ephesians chapter 6 is we've just got to learn to use the authority that's been given to us to overcome the power he has as the prince of this world. Peter tells us that he, he prowls around like a roaring lion. Listen, his goal is to devour you. That's Satan's goal. That's your enemy. This, it is not a playground. It is a battleground. And we've been studying in Ephesians, all right? So Satan will do everything he can, let me work through where we've been, to disrupt the mission. Satan will do everything he can to keep us from being every person in every place filling everyday life with Jesus. That is the mission of the church. And Satan will do everything he can to disrupt that mission. He will do everything he can to tell you you're not a masterpiece, a missionary of the mission. He will lie to you, he will speak into you, he will do everything he can to convince you that you have no place filling that mission. 
that you are not the masterpiece, he says, that you are, and that you do have everything you need to complete that mission. Chapter 2. Chapter 3, he will do everything he can to wreck the motive of love. Two things. He will do everything he can to tell you that you are not good enough to be loved by God. There are some sitting in this room right now who don't think they're good enough, who don't think where they've been can be erased, who don't think that they'll ever measure up, who don't think they can ever do enough right things. That's the enemy telling you that you fall short of God's love. Paul reminded us in Ephesians chapter 3 that his love is so wide, so deep, so great that we can't even fathom how much his love is for us. That Jesus stretched out his arms and said, this much is how much I love you. And he died on the cross for you, not just for your neighbor, for you. Because he loves you that much. Second thing, Satan, and I believe he's doing this with all of his power in today's culture. He will do everything he can to wreck the word love. He will do everything he can to get us to grab onto a concept of love that's not a biblical love. Our world has taken this word and twisted it. And we're going to learn how to put on armor to defeat that. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4. Satan will do everything he can to destroy the unity that Jesus gave us. Remember in Ephesians chapter 4, Jesus said didn't create unity. We're to maintain the unity. Jesus already gave us unity. We're just to work together together. And the gifts that he's given us, some of us are apostles, some of us prophets, some of us evangelists, some of us shepherds, some of us teachers. All of us use our gifts to build up the body, to equip the saints, to grow together so that we work together in unity. (laughs) If you've been around the church any length of time, surely you don't have to say, oh, I'm shocked that Satan would try to destroy our unity. Amy and I were out of town this week. We were... Uh, visiting uh, a ministry called the Timothy Initiative. Some of you may be familiar with it. Fantastic initiative. Listen, the whole thing is about reaching every village around the world with one Christian and one church, to get a Christian and a church in every village around the world. This This is amazing to me. They have mapped out, listen to this, they have mapped out every village that exists on the face of the earth. And they are working to find out every village, whether it has a Christian and a church. And if it doesn't, they're sending missionaries into those villages. But listen, this is too big for the Timothy Initiative. They're partnering with churches around the world. And they're partnering with all kinds of other parachurch ministries. And listen, it's like, okay, you're working in that area. Yeah, you take those villages. We'll take these villages. And you know what? Not all of those churches, this is going to shock you. Hold on. Not all of those churches and not all of those parachurch organizations agree on everything. But they're all working in unity together. Right? Satan will do everything he can to disrupt our Unity. He will do everything he can. We were in Ephesians chapter 5 last week. To keep us from walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. He will do everything he can to limit our access to the power that's freely been given to us. So, Ephesians chapter 6, Paul wraps up telling us then, That we're not living on a playground. We are living on a battleground. And here's how we fight that battle. Verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Here's what he says. Finally. Man, every good churchgoer loves the word finally, right? When a preacher stands up and says finally. You know what it means? Absolutely nothing. But here's what Paul says. Finally. He's getting ready to wrap up his letter. Finally. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. A couple of things here. We've looked at some different postures in the book or the letter of Ephesians. 
We've learned that we are seated with Christ. We've learned that we bow to Christ in worship and prayer. We learned that we are called to walk in love, walk in light, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're called to stand on the battleground against our enemy. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, he's he's talking specifically about our enemy Satan here, okay? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Remember in Ephesians chapter 5, he said, walk in light? Over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, verse 13. Some of you have probably heard this before. Therefore, remember, anytime you see the word therefore, what do you need to ask yourself? Why is it there? What's it there for? Okay? Because he tells us to stand on the battleground against our enemy. And here's what he tells us to do to do that. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, there's that word stand again, in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Anytime you're studying the Bible and you see a word repeated over and over and over, there's something significant about it, okay? Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now he's going to go through a description of typical warrior gear, Roman soldier gear that would have been very... Everyone in the first century culture recognized the Roman soldier and knew exactly what their gear was. And he's going to go through this and he attaches tools that we have access to to defeat the enemy, to work from that place of victory. Okay? So the first one he says is stand having fastened on the belt of truth. The belt of truth. The belt of truth. What does a belt do? Holds things up, does it not? Right? Like, some of you are like, well, I just wear a belt for fashion. You will reach a point in life (laughs) where belt becomes a tool of function, (laughs) of necessity. And it holds the pants up. Some of you have heard me tell this story here at Aldersgate before, one of our famous wedding stories. We had a wedding here. The father of the bride walks the bride down the center of the aisle. At that point, we had center steps here leading up to the platform, gets to the front. I'm not officiating the ceremony. Jimmy Nunn is officiating the ceremony. He gets to the part where he says, who gives this woman to be married to this man? The father hands off his daughter to the groom. And when he does that, his pants fall all the way down to his ankles. And just in reaction, he bends over to pick them up. And then we can all see that he's wearing whitey tidies. <laughs> and then again, out of reaction, he says, son of a gun. <laughs> Not really, but close. <laughs> and Jimmy says, let us pray, right? I mean, what else do you do in that situation? Because a belt does not come with a rented tuxedo. Suspenders do. But he must have thought they weren't important. The belt holds everything up. Listen, here's what Paul is saying. Truth holds everything up. The truth holds everything up. Let me remind you, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In fact, in John chapter 17, here's what Jesus said. Sanctify them in your truth. Sanctify means uh, continue to grow in them, continue to work in them, continue to transform them in your truth. And then here's what Jesus said. Your word is the truth. The truth does not come from our world. Listen, the world has truth to sell. But the truth does not come from the world. The truth does not come from our flesh. Listen, the enemy is at work here. We live in a culture today where the world says, hey, you believe whatever you want to believe. As long as you don't infringe on what I believe, we'll get along great. But you're welcome to believe whatever you want to believe. 
Friends, that is not the truth. The truth does not come from the world. It does not come from our flesh. And it certainly does not come from the enemy. Oh, our enemy knows the truth. And the oldest trick in the book, Genesis chapter 3, God's created Adam and Eve. He comes to Adam and Eve, the enemy, and says, did God actually say? See, the enemy knows the truth so well, he twists it to where it still sounds like the truth, but it's not the truth. Paul says, the first thing we got to do is put on the belt of truth. We got to know the truth because the truth holds everything up. And he says this. He's going to keep going through the Roman soldier's gear. He says, so, put on the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. Now, in first century culture, the breastplate is what identified a Roman soldier. When, when you were wearing the breastplate, you were a Roman soldier. You, you were ready to go to battle at any time. That identified you as a Roman soldier, okay? Um, if you are uh, dressed in running gear, you're going to run, yes? Okay? If, if you're dressed in... Um, <laughs> at some point, you will realize that running gear is really just good to run in, okay? Okay? Like, if you're dressed for cold, you're going to go out into the cold. If you're dressed for hot, you're going to go out into the hot. Like, what I'm trying to say is the breastplate said, this is what I'm dressed for. Here's what Paul's saying. we got to put on the breastplate of righteousness. So here's what Paul's saying. Listen, if you know the truth, if the truth is holding everything up, it's not good enough to just know it. you got to walk in it. Right? Like, listen, we are not made righteous by our own works. Paul has talked a lot about that in the letter to the Ephesians, right? We are not created uh, by our works. We are created to our works. We are not saved by our works. We are saved to good works. We are masterpieces created. God created these works for us in advance, it says, to do these works, right? Like, we were created to do these things. We don't do these things so that we can accept God's love. We do these things because God's already loved us. And here's what Paul's saying. Listen, you, you got to walk the walk. Right? If you know the truth, you got to live the truth. you got to live out that righteousness. In Ephesians chapter 5, he said, walk in love, walk in light, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. We know these things to be true. We've got to live in them. Okay? So here's what he's saying. Pull up everything with the belt of truth. You know the truth, now walk in it. All right? He goes on. He continues to describe this armor. He says, um, verse 15, Shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. When you put on shoes, what does that usually mean? You're going somewhere. What kind of shoes are we to put on? The shoes of the gospel. Think about this for a minute. Paul is literally saying, one of the ways we fight the enemy is to share the gospel everywhere we go. This whole fall, I've been preaching this message. We preached a three-week three series called Good God Gospel. Talking about having good conversations that turn into God conversations that turn into gospel conversations everywhere we go. We followed that up by diving into the book of Ephesians. The very first thing, here's the mission that's been given to the church. Every person in every place filling everyday life with Jesus. It's not over. In January, I'm going to continue to preach the same message. In February, I'm going to preach the same message. In April and May, I'm going to preach the same message. 
Here's why. Because I believe, friends, the enemy is winning in the church because the church has become lackadaisical about sharing the gospel. And isn't it interesting that Paul says, if we want to fight the enemy, one of the things we need to do is share the gospel everywhere we go. Every time we put on our shoes. Well, Ryan, I don't wear shoes. I walk, I walk barefoot. Any good Roman soldier wore special shoes that gave him special footing when he came into battle. Any Christ follower who realizes we're on a battleground and not a playground knows that we've got to be sharing the gospel in every place, everywhere. The shoes of the gospel. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. Now we're talking with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Listen, we don't really care about the belt, the breastplate, like, give me the shield, right? We just want the shield. The shield was not what set a Roman soldier apart. That was the breastplate of righteousness. The shield was used to defend against the fiery darts. And listen to what Paul calls it, the shield of faith. What is faith? At its simple, most basic truth, faith is trust in God. When we unpack that a little bit more with what we're told in the New Testament about what faith is, it's trust in God even when we can't see where he's calling us to go or what he's calling us to do. Here's what Paul is saying. You want to fight the enemy? you got to keep stepping into the unknown. you you got to keep stepping out in places that you're not comfortable with. you you got to keep... You remember the story of Peter in the boat with all the disciples when the storm came up and then Jesus came walking to them on water and Peter says, Jesus, if it's you, tell me. I'm going to get out on this water. I'm going to walk to you. And Jesus says, Peter, it's me. And so Peter crawls out of the boat and he begins to walk towards Jesus. You remember that story? That's what Paul's saying here we got to get out of the boat. Right? Like sometimes when we preach that story, we focus on, oh, Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. He began to sink. Let's preach on the part of the story about the other disciples in the boat who didn't even get out of the side of it. Paul's saying, listen, you step out of the boat. Yeah, I know you don't know where you're going. I know you don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I know it's scary. Paul says you keep trusting God. Put on that Shield of faith and keep stepping out into the unknown. Keep trusting God even when you can't see where it's leading. And take the helmet of salvation. Well, we get this. We're a culture of helmets. We take the helmet seriously in our culture today. We wear it for everything. Take the helmet of salvation. Why do we wear it for everything? Because it protects our being. And we've learned that our being is important, is it not? As not a rhetorical question... Like our brain's pretty important, is it not? So we want to do everything we can to protect it. So we wear a helmet to protect it. Because it gives us not only our basic bodily functions, but it gives us higher functions. Here's what our brain does. It tells us who we are. Here's what Paul's saying. Your enemy is a liar. And he will do everything he can to convince you You're not a child of God. You're not loved by God. You're not good enough for God. You can't step out of the boat. You can't do any of those things. Paul says, put on the helmet. Protect your your being. Know who God created you to be. You are he who says you are. He loves you the way he says he loves you. You are good enough. Not because you're good enough, but because Jesus says you're good enough. Right? Like we need that because Satan's going to do everything he can to lie to us. And then here's what he says. Look at this. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Haven't we already been there? The belt was the word, right? This is very different. 
Paul says, take the sword of the Spirit. Probably Paul, we're not sure who the writer of Hebrews is, but probably Paul. Paul writes in Hebrews, chapter 4, I believe, that the sword of the Spirit, the Bible, the truth, God's Word, is like a sword. And it pierces to the deepest part of who we are. Here's what Paul's saying. We got to know the truth. We got to live out the truth. We got to walk in righteousness. But here's what he's saying to fight the enemy. We've got to continually be transformed by the truth, by the word. Right? Like here at Aldersgate, here's what we say We believe this is the inspired word of God. We believe it's the ultimate authority over our lives. And we believe that those who hear and obey will find true life change and transformation. And sometimes when you hear this teaching, oh, the sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon, and blah, blah, you know, all this kind of stuff. Look, I just think Paul is simply saying, if we're not continually letting the word transform us, we're losing the battle. We've got to constantly let the word of God transform who we are. Now, I love this. Watch what he says. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Who are the saints? We are. And also for me, Paul says, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly, to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Sometimes the Bible's just funny. If you know anything about Paul, you don't think, hmm, he had a hard time opening his mouth boldly. But yet he prays that he would be able to do that. And then he says, I'm an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Sometimes when we are preaching or teaching through this, we see prayer as a separate piece of the armor. All right, we, we, we put on the belt, we put on the breastplate, we put on the shoes, we take up the shield, uh, we put on our helmet, we've got the sword, and there's prayer. As I was studying to share this, I saw it in a different light. I've never seen it this way before. But here's how I see it, and here's how I'm going to share it with you today. I don't think prayer is a separate piece of armor. I think prayer is how we put on all the other pieces of armor. Hear me out on this. He says, and pray at all times in the spirit. At all times, right? Pray at all times in the spirit. Listen, here's what I think he's saying. You can't put on the belt of truth by yourself. You need to be praying in the spirit. You can't wear the breastplate of righteousness by yourself. You need to be praying in the Spirit. You can't put on those shoes of the gospel by yourself. You need to be praying in the Spirit. You can't hold the shield of faith and step into the unknown by yourself. You need to be praying in the Spirit. You can't put on the helmet of salvation by, your, by yourself. You need to be praying in the Spirit. You can't let the Word of God transform you on an ongoing basis. You need to be praying in the Spirit. Praying is how we dress ourselves with all the other pieces of armor. And look what Paul says. We should pray at all times. Let me just ask you a question. Does that leave any time out? Like Paul's saying, listen, all the time, you can't do this enough. And he says, pray in the Spirit, right? When we pray in the Spirit, it's not according to my will, it's according to his will. I want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. We were there last week, right? Make all these supplications. And then he says this, keep alert. What does that mean? <laughs> Here's what it means. If you're going to a prayer meeting to pray for rain, you better take an umbrella. You better be ready for an answer to what you're praying for. Now, God doesn't always answer the way we want him to answer. That's what praying in the Spirit means. God doesn't always answer when we want him to answer. And sometimes the answer is no. Teenagers, am I right on this? Sometimes the answer is no, right? If it's not, you need to have a conversation with your parents. Sometimes the, conversation, sometimes the answer is no. Because our parents, no. I look back on this with my parents. Sometimes when they told me no, 
I couldn't see it at the time, but they knew what was best for me. Sometimes God says no because he knows what's best for us. But that's an answer to prayer. God does answer prayer. And if we're going to be bold enough to pray for something, we better expect an answer to what we're praying for. Right? And then he says this, persevere in those prayers. Mark Batterson wrote a book called The Circle Maker. And here's what he talks about. He says, then, take what you're praying for, your supplication and your request, draw a circle around it, and you just keep circling that prayer. Circle, 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 circle. Just keep circling. Persevere in that prayer. So here's what I want to do today as we wrap up this series. I shared with you in Ephesians that Paul gave us two prayers. He gave us a prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, a prayer of enlightenment. In Ephesians chapter 3, he gave us a prayer of enablement. I've asked you to be praying those prayers. Make them personal. Pray the scripture over your life, over people in your life. The truth is, I actually think Paul gave us three prayers in the letter to the Ephesians. Because I think Ephesians chapter 6 is a prayer. And he wants us to pray on the armor of God. So we're going to close today, we're going to close this message series by praying the armor of God. So you can keep your Bible open in front of you if you want to look at it. You can put it beside you, close your eyes. I would invite you to go ahead and come to the altar and kneel if you want to do that. You can kneel at your seat if you want to do that. You can raise your hands. You can just put your hands out in a posture of receiving. I'm going to guide us, but I want you to pray your prayer. You can pray it out loud. You can pray it silently. You can write it out. You can do whatever it is that the Holy Spirit wants to do in you at this time. But let's pray this prayer. God, we want to put on the belt of truth. In your spirit, in the power of the spirit, help us keep our pants up with the truth. God, we want to wear the breastplate of righteousness. Help us stress ourselves in righteousness. Help us to walk the talk. God, may we not be accused of living one way on Sunday and a different way on Monday. God, help us to lace up our shoes. And in all the places you take us, may we have good God gospel conversations. When you present us with an opportunity, may you help us step into that opportunity with the shoes of the gospel. God, help us to pick up the shield of faith. When you say go, may we go. When you say speak, may we speak. When you say stay, may we stay. Help us get out of the boat. And trust. Thank you for the helmet of salvation. May we wear it <clears throat> in such a way that we're constantly reminded of who you say we are. And God, we pray that you would give us such a love and a hunger for your word. 
that if Satan is prowling around to devour us, may we devour your word at a greater level. And may we not only hear, but obey. And may it transform us, change us. May we pray on a regular basis that we would put all these pieces of armor on and in that, God, you would give us a vision of the victory that you've already won for us. May we pray in such a way that we're alert and may we persevere 